Okay, so this is Mrs. H Psychology and it's paper three, Addiction. And this time it is how to reduce addiction, specifically drug therapy. Okay, so if your screen is a bit fuzzy on YouTube, you can just go to your settings and improve the quality. Okay, you should have a little cog. Click on the cog and you can improve the quality and that should improve it. At the moment you won't be able to see very much because I'm just showing you the pattern of the mind map and then I'm going to zoom in on certain areas to make it clearer. Okay, so here we go. We have got, just so you know the branches, talking about drug therapy. We've got the types we're looking at here, so a little branch there. I'm gonna mention nicotine, I'm gonna mention gambling. Those are the two substances, or rather nicotine is our substance and gambling is our other addiction we need to look at for AQA. And then we're gonna look at the evaluation. Okay, here we go. So drug addiction and drug therapy is really dealing with chemicals that have a particular effect on the functioning brain or, or the body system. Okay, So we're looking at neurotransmitters. So we need to look at the three types of drug therapy. So we've got, first of all, aversives. Let's zoom in here. Aversives. Right, aversives are basically trying to produce a, an unpleasant, trying to form an association with an unpleasant consequence. So the association with unpleasant experience or consequence. So for example, something like vomiting, something that makes you feel like you've got a, a really bad hangover, something like that. So one example would be dialsifram. Um, and basically the idea there is that they treat alcoholics by creating hypersensitivity to alcohol. So um, with these aversives, Often the substance is taken, the medication is taken at the same time as alcohol and therefore this association is built up. So remember the law of contiguity, close together in time, so you form an association. And with this particular substance, there's a severe hangover very soon afterwards, five to ten minutes later. Okay, so aversives are to create some sort of negative um, association with the substance. Next ones we're going to look at are agonists and antagonists. So a little a diagram here to help you. Agonists are drugs, um, substances that occupy the receptors and activate them. So if you remember from your um, uh, synaptic transmission in biopsychology, okay, agonists will actually occupy the receptors and then activate them. Okay, so here we have uh, an agonist an example, and so we get full activation. Antagonists, though, if we have a look over here, antagonists are something that actually block the receptor site. So the substance is not able to get in, if you like, and activate it. So another little diagram here, which I quite like. So before the drug, there's our natural substance, there's our receptor site, and the natural substance fits in like a lock and key, as you know, to get normal cellular activity. Um, with the agonist, it blocks, it, sorry, it takes up that site, so it triggers the response, okay? So it acts like the normal substance. It has the same effect of lock and key as a normal substance. But with antagonist, you can see here, nice little illustration, this is blocking the site, so the normal substance can't slot into it and activate, okay? So the difference between agonist and antagonist is worth stating. So if we go on to examples then, we've got for nicotine, first of all, nicotine replacement therapy. So let's talk a little bit about that and you can add in some details. Before you do that, I would say that it's worth you looking at maybe having a look at um, different websites on this for a little bit more information. I'm just going to show one up on the screen now. So for example, um, this is on patient information, so nicotine replacement therapy. So it gives you lots of information about you know, what it is and all sorts of questions that can be answered. So well worth you having a look at that. So in terms of nicotine replacement therapy, okay, this can come in the form of gum, inhalers, patches, to deliver the psychoactive substance. But the point is that it's less harmful, right? So nicotine is the most addictive in tobacco but it's not the most harmful um, substance in tobacco. So the idea is it's more acceptable to let somebody have a um, nicotine replacement because it's cleaner and also we can have much more control over the dose. So we still get that dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens, 
right? Um, as we've already described in our biological nicotine um, uh, regulation model. Um, but the, the advantage here is that the nicotine can be reduced over time and the withdrawal from that can be managed over time. So there are big advantages with it. Okay, now in terms of gambling, at the moment there aren't any drugs, currently there aren't any drugs on offer, but there is the possibility of an opioid antagonist, right? So remember antagonist block, and one might be naltroxone. Okay, so it's, um, it's worth us exploring that just for a moment. So just to outline this for a little bit more detail, what happens with these op opioid um, antagonists, they block the dopamine impulses. It enhances release of some of the uh, neurotransmitters GABA, and that has a calming effect on the nervous system and supposedly then would reduce the cravings for gambling. Okay, so this is for gambling, it's not for nicotine. So that just outlines very briefly what the, you know, what, what would actually be occurring there. Okay, so let's evaluate this. And if we have a look, we've got weaknesses and strengths, and we've got quite a little bit, lot of information. So let's go with the strengths first of all. Okay, so first of all, let's have a look at Steed's research. Okay, so what we're saying is one strength is the effectiveness of these um, substances, of these of this medication, of these drug treatments, and particularly here we're talking about nicotine. N NRT, nicotine replacement therapy. So Steed looked at 150 quality studies, so a very large sample, and Steed et al, and they concluded that all um, nicotine replacement therapy was more effective than just having a placebo or no, no treatment at all. So it is more effective, and what they found was the nasal spray was more most effective. So um, some nice results really, up to 70% um, more abstinence, plus abstinence, more abstinence, six months later with the um, nicotine replacement therapy than, um, than if they were not, you know, if they were in a no treatment group or a placebo group. Um, the other things they found were that obviously NRT is safer, it's less harmful than cigarette smoking um, because you're getting rid of the harmful effects of the inhaling the smoke and, and uh, um, tar, etc., etc. And also the other good thing about it, it doesn't increase the dependence on an alternative, that's meant to say alter alternative, alternative, um, because some of the other substances do mean that people get addicted to other substances. So Steve's research was, um, was showing how effective this NRT is. The other thing, of course, is because NRT is effective, it's also giving validity for our biological explanation. So um, a nicotine regulation model, for example, this provides uh, substance for that. It provides validity for that. Because if people are um, being able to be helped by replacing the nicotine with, with, um, in some other form, that shows that um, you know the it is the nicotine that's actually uh, the, the the dopamine fix really that is causing the the problem and um, causing people to become more addicted. Okay. Now at this point, you might then, if you're writing an essay, go on to the weaknesses and start to develop the weaknesses as well, so you have balance in your essay. But at the moment, I'm just going to carry on with the strengths um, for us. So another strength would be um, with the effectiveness of this replacement and this biological, these biological um, treatment programs, these drug treatment programs, is it removes the stigma. Okay, so often there's a belief that addiction is somehow the result of moral weakness or it's the adult's fault. And if we can introduce a biological explanation, then it it gets um, it moves away from that idea that it's somehow you know a, the, the fault of somebody who has become addicted. Um, so the more we accept neurochemical explanations, the more we can move away from that that sort of get rid of that stigma for people. 
Um, and the other thing, the other benefit also with uh, substance replacement is it does remove the need to source that substance. And obviously, um, it's often when people are trying to source their, um, their, their fix, they are going to get involved with criminal sources. Um, sometimes the medication is not, you know, whatever substance they're taking is not clean. Um, and therefore, they, their chances of success if they have a replacement like this, are going to be increased. Going on to the weaknesses, we have the problem is it's all very well for, um, it seems to be very effective for nicotine, but there's less support for other substances. So if we have a look at a couple of other studies. So what we're saying is the evidence for drug therapy for other substances is not quite so convincing as it is for nicotine. So let's have a look at the Malcolm et al. study. All right, so basically it had group A um, using buspirone, and buspirone, I think it is pronounced, um, which was a, a drug versus a placebo group B. So group A had the drug, group B was a, had a placebo. And what they found, and this was trying to treat alcohol consumption, so they found no significant differences in the alcohol consumed between the two groups or their anxiety. And so what they, they concluded was maybe it's the belief um, in the, the drug that's actually more important for some of these substances than the actual um, medication, if you like, than the actual drug itself. We can also look at the McClellan study. So this time uh, McClellan was looking at heroin and um, doing some research with heroin addicts. They had two groups. Group A was just taking methadone. Group B had methadone and psychotherapy. And actually what happened was 69% of group A eventually had to be withdrawn um, from, the, from the research. Why was that? Well, unfortunately, they had eight consecutive positive urine samples showing that they were continuing to use heroin. So they're still using heroin. Um, and what they found was the group, the group B, the methadone and psychotherapy um, were actually responding much better. So in other words, what we're concluding is it seems that the um, drug treatment might be quite effective for nicotine, but on its own, drug treatment doesn't necessarily seem very, um, very useful for and very successful for other substances, for, for other addicts, um, uh, people who are addicted to other substances. So here we have, no, for nicotine, it seems good, but for other substances, it's very questionable whether it is effective. Um, and it seems that with other substances, it seems to be much more effective when it's combined with other treatments, um, so other psychological treatments. But unfortunately, there is a big cost implication because other treatments, um, CBT, for example, psychotherapy, might be time consuming and also you need trained staff to do that. And you need, and obviously that's going to be um, very costly as well. The other thing we can talk about is, unfortunately, there are also side effects. So, for example, with naltrexone, um, it was a very high dose, and that meant there were worse side effects um, to to that to those for those people um, taking that substance as well. And of course, if you imagine if you're getting awful side effects and you're not getting a high from it, then the result might be to give up. Right? That you know people are more inclined to just say, oh, I can't cope with this, I'm going to give up with it. Okay. Another weakness is that there are individual differences, and so these, these medication, these, um, these drug treatments are not suitable for everyone. So, for example, we've got here genetic variations, pregnant women and prisoners. Um, basically, obviously, pregnant women, it's not going to be suitable all the time because of the potential harm to their fetus, to their baby. Um, unless it is possible that that might be causing less harm than them actually using the drug, so you'd um, you know uh, that would have to be considered. All the factors would have to be considered. 
um, we've also got prisoners it may be that you know this is quite time consuming this um, treatment program so there may be periods of supervision which might exceed their time in prison so they might start in prison but then um, you know maybe released etc etc and genetic variations and it seems like these genetic variations actually have a, a big impact on the outcome on the results so for example the effectiveness of naltrexone depends on the variation of a single gene right? and alcoholics with one variant respond very differently to those with another variant okay so um, for example we've got research by people like Chung et al who found drug treatment needs to be very much tailored to their individual needs and individual genes specifically their individual genes in order to um, secure the most success for them for the patient and so that is then if I um, decrease it so you can see what we've covered basically that then covers our whole um, picture about drug therapy and um, gives you an outline on those so hopefully that will be useful for you.